So the question of easier now or later is a, it's a difficult one. Uh, I, I don't even know if it's even relevant, but uh, we have to have something related to the past. You know, one of the biggest things we discussed is given climate change, and if, if, we, if we just focus on this complex here, and the amount of disturbance that we have been able um, to experience as well as achieve, in the future, it may not be as easy to simply rely on lightning. Uh, we were talking um, when we did the South Fork Sun prescribed fire. We did that largely to allow natural processes, lightning caused fires, to play more of a role on the flathead side, on the other side of the continental divide, and to reduce the impacts of loss of structures. And I still remember uh, Jerry Williams talking a lot about loss plus cost plus damage to resources was where the major cost was in fire. And we were trying to avoid that. We're not so sure that we can simply wait for more natural processes. Um, after we did the South Fork Sunburn, many people asked us, well, can you do that in other places, like headquarters and other parts of the Canyon Creek Fire or other parts of the Gates Park Fire within the wilderness? And we said, well, wilderness is natural processes. We're not trying to create something simply for human beings. But in reality, with climate change, when we look at the socio-ecological connection of fire and the need for fire, and that the likelihood is that lightning will continue to happen, we may need to get a lot more assertive in applying management ignitions or prescribed fire in the wilderness. If for any other reason, not to backslide on what's being gained. Because we had a period there, and I think Carol had that from, from 19, 30 through 1960 or 70, where we had very little fire. And some of that might have been the result of the Salish back in the Flathead not doing management ignition on their own prior to the area becoming national forest. But uh, that's what I see is necessary if we're going to make that connection with people and the benefit of fire is that. Um, we had a discussion about what's, what's to be gained in the big W if we prescribe more fire. Well, we heard it. It's about water. It's about that connection of organic matter into the soil. It's about managing smoke into the future. And uh, it may just take prescribed fire to do it. And if we, if, if we, contribute to that with management commission, we're going to leave something better for people in the future. Anything for the group to have? No? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how about group three? Okay, so we started talking about um, forest planning in particular. So how do we consider these climate changes? and when actually drafting forest planning measures. And kind of the idea was that forest planning needs to include the ability to adapt to climate change. So we can't really plant since we don't know exactly what will happen with climate change, especially since a lot of this research is coming out now, and the forest planning process started 10 year, eight years ago. Um, it's what, the, what is being put into these plans is a, the ability to adapt and they're being planned at the mountain range level versus abstract lines that were drawn that don't really have an ecological basis. Um, and we were worried that with climate change, perhaps um, it'd be harder to allow for fires in the wilderness because of the like fear of loss of certain vegetation types. Um, but the argument then for that would be, well, we need to continue to allow for wilderness fire because if we don't, we're only gonna get fires when we can no longer suppress it, and those are those high severity fires that we then really see these ecological transitions. And from ec an ecologi ecologist's point of view, you know, we want these fires to occur because then they're in sync with the climate and perhaps more able to adapt. Um, and also they provide then a reference point for outside wilderness areas. So you do have some arguments for fire in the face of climate change, 
but it gets back to talking points. So you can make all these arguments like landscape heterogeneity or in sync, but if you're talking to the public, whether it's inside or particularly outside the wilderness, how do you how do you convey that to them and how do you get them on board? So perhaps words like heterogeneity is not what you want to be saying to the public and you need to have those talking points for the public. Um, and then particularly that work starts before the fire starts. So if you need to be conveying this to the public, that needs to start before the fire. Challenge then is there can be short, short memories. So unless a big fire happened last year, sometimes it's hard to get people there until the fire starts. And at that point, emotions might be running too high. So how do you get around that? Um, and there, we did say in areas like these where there's this strong background, people are used to fire, used to spoke, you do have a little bit better of a chance of getting that community on board. Um, so yeah, that was anything else? Thank you, Julia. Good job. Okay, group two. What was the question again? Why I do what I do? <laughs> <laughs> I do what I do because Mike is my boss and he tells me what I should do. <laughs> no, just joking. Um, it's a really tough question and I'm, I don't know if I really like the question. Is it easier now or easier later? Um, our group talked about it in a bunch of different scenarios. I think if you do look at the map, um, I think for like us right now, I do think it's easier for us now, just because of the map and what's out there. Um, there's several instances where we've had fires um, that have started behind other big fires. You know, we've been able to manage those fires for resource benefit, just because of the hard times that you know other FMOs have went through, or maybe we had went through a couple summers before that. Um, Family Peaks is a really good instance right here. Wasn't a great time for us, um, but we got through it. You know, a couple years later, we had the crucifixion fire. There was 8,000 acres, and it was right behind it, right, right in the Family Peak. You know, we would have been dealing with that same situation a couple years later if we hadn't dealt with Family Peak at that particular time. But we all made it through. So as far as the complex goes, I think, in the situation that we're in, I do think it is easier, I guess, for me as an FMO. Um, probably for Mike a little bit as a ranger, too. But as far as in whole and everything you know we have going on in the whole world of the United States and fire, I think it is going to be a little bit difficult too because people want to push that into other places, maybe not in the wilderness, do it closer to Wui. I think that's going to be very difficult. And I think once we start doing that, we get into the whole social aspect of it, and that is also a big, I guess probably one of the biggest components of it. You know, to get people on early, um, we got to do a lot more education. We got to keep doing that. We got to keep prescribed burning, and that sort of thing. Um, as far as the social impact here, I think is it easier? Eh. I would say it's getting easier. You know, we're such a small, I don't know, small community, I guess, you know, in the big picture. Um, we talked about a lot of times by the time fires get here to the Northern Rockies, it's later in the year, everybody's been watching the news, you know, subdivisions have burned down and there's been all this, you know, bad publicity of fire and everything, and it's still going on. Well, when we have our fires here in the wilderness, I don't, people are paying attention to them, but I don't think it's getting quite the scrutiny as it might've got, you know, 10, 20 years ago, just because of all the other things that are going on. So I think that makes it a little bit easier for us. Um, what else do we have, group? Anything? We talked about some budget stuff, but that's kind of hard to wait from. <laughs> You're saying his budget, how long ago was that? In 1985, we had $150,000 to manage wilderness fire in the entire northern Rockies region. So we talked about that one, we very far now. We <laughs> couldn't really compare that. <laughs> two days. <laughs> yeah. That's about it. Thank you. Okay. I hear everybody wanting to talk about the public, and um, we'll do some more of that. Uh, some people might argue that the, the last talk of the day would be the least important, but actually the last talk of the day today is going to be, you know, what do we do? <laughs> How do we get there? So are you ready, though, to pick up and sure. do your talk? So, okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit. And um, and talk, get a Washington office perspective and some updates, and then we'll have a couple of folks who are closer to operational management uh, talk about some tools and insights. So we just talked about uh, covered a fair amount of ground. Um, talked about uh, you know communicating course of action in the WIFDIS. Um, and making sure to really tell tell the full story of why um, brought up, um, you know, we might tell people that we've got people monitoring out there, um, monitoring the fire, but we need to tell them what they're monitoring for, 
what actions might be um, following on the heels to protect their interests um, and just keep them informed and that sort of that sort of thing. But telling the whole story, unpacking it, and you know, um, treating the public um, intelligently, uh, knowing that they're intelligent, and, and not being afraid to um, go into some depth on, on information on fire. Um, some of the the things we also talked about were. Um, just that, that ability to respond on the fire um, to specific public questions. Um, and we had a, had a few examples of you know, being able to take care of, um, having that knowledge out, out on the fire ground, local knowledge to take care of, to take care of people's um, concerns in real time um, doesn't help to help or to try to address their problem if the, you know, long after the fact, um, you have to have people out there that can, can address it on the ground. Um, and then and having folks on the ground that know some of the nuances of, of local economies, um, you know, how people are being impacted specifically by those fires. Um, one thing we spent quite a bit of time talking about was just, um, it's been an um, improvement over time, it seems to us, as far as um, letting the public actually see fire and um, not kind of um, shutting them out of the fire environment as much, you know, we used to, um, 2000, we shut the, the forest down. Um, it seems like there's been a steady progression and, and with repeat fires and um, a little bit, um, at least areas where we're seeing some um, lower fire behavior, um, chances to watch some uh, mo moderate fire behavior for the public, places that, um, where they're, they're safe to do that. Um, seems like we're, we've got had more opportunities in the last few big fire seasons even to have people um, have that experience and the public have that experience. So it's not that thing that's happening back there that we're not even allowed to see um, until it does roll out of the mountains. Um, so, um, and talked about some other opportunities to do that um, as far as getting people out on prescribed fires, um, you know, and not being afraid to, to get them right out there and maybe hand them the drip torch or whatever. Um, to, to get, get experience and actually see what we're doing. Thank you. That's great. You have two, right? Mm -hmm. So I love the idea of crowdsourcing our fire monitoring program. <laughs> 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 That's pretty awesome. And I wanted to make a plug for this handout because it does have examples of objectives that you can write for your wilderness fire program in case you're struggling with how to convey that. Uh, what our group talked about was um, could we define what we really do want from the public because we're never going to get to 100% uh, acceptance by the public? So how much is enough and how much do we strive for and then just move on? Uh, people are more accepting if they feel like the decision maker is being transparent and explaining why and not being patronizing and saying, well, don't worry, we're taking care of it. And how, how can we work on that? Um, Transparency is important before the fire, but also at the time of the fire, and that's mostly due to uncertainty. We had the benefit of having Sarah in our group, so um, <laughs> we talked about um, having uh, uncertainty really play a role at the time of the fire in um, alleviating their concerns. Um, local off-duty relationships are really important and really great when you sit next to those other people in the stands at the basketball games and the football games, and you have relationships with your kids in the school, or community events, um, they see you as a real person that they can trust and not just a fire person because it's harder for them to talk smack about the Forest Service if they really mm -hmm. know who you are. Um, having our own local people speak at um, incident management team briefings, a lot of times a uh, out of state team will come in and they speak differently about fire and our landscape and our values than we would speak to our own friends and uh, community members about the fire, so we should be messaging more and not relying on necessarily the PIOs from the incident management teams. And uh, agency administrators can't let incident management teams off the hook if they're not following the guidance that the AA set for them, and we need to um, be more explicit in our direction and then hold people accountable for that. Oh, and show interagency cooperation builds trust for the public. If we're in fighting among partners, it doesn't look good and doesn't make us uh, trustworthy. Unless anyone has anything else. Thanks, Um Yeah, so we were surprised that in the surveys there wasn't more reluctance to support fire because of after fire effects and um, just kind of 
discuss where we had seen that and maybe if that's that difference between like just looking at wilderness fire versus you know including prescribed fire and um, thinning. We also thought maybe a potential way to sell it to the public would be better tabs and controls on cost. So um, Brad mentioned that you know the, at the national at the national level they're keeping track of what these costs are, but then aren't filtering that information down. So there's no way to sell or like it's less easy to sell. Look at how much less this costs. Um, and we kind of agree that this trust issue is key, and we're seeing it over and over again. And that, but with the lack of resources available, it's kind of self-fulfilling. So as resources dwindle and more and more resources are put towards fire, less and less resources are available for post-fire restoration. So it kind of then, everyone says, oh, the Forest Service can't handle the fires because there's no trails open. That just continues to spiral. Um, and that's really important to be proactive. In terms of that trust, it's really important to be proactive. So own your decisions. When you make a decision to close a trail, um, just close it and say why and tell the public why. And then if you don't have to close a trail, keep it open because that kind of exposure um, where someone can hike in and see fire and it kind of normalizes fire and gets across that message that fire isn't life-threatening. It's just part of the system. Um, and we really want to see like this planning for fire use, like the pods become more available, both internally um, and then externally. So can the public use it to kind of better understand why these decisions are being made? Um, there's a little bit of discussion like the difference between the current public, so in getting current um, dis like county commissioners involved versus the future public. So um, maybe that can be kind of complex. Um, and doo -doo -doo. yeah, and that kind of the seven years after fires when you really start to see the real impacts. So how do we continue to like mitigate those um, with the way the funding is currently structured? Vita, can I just turn uh, quick? Yes. Um, in terms of the post-fire rehab, a really great thing to do is um, if you can let volunteers come in and help with the rehab. Um, one of the hardest things for people, A, it helps them learn, it helps them see the landscape, but a lot of times what people have the hardest time is they've lost this landscape that they love. Um, and A, it can help them see it recover, but they also feel like they're helping it recover, and so that can actually really make a difference to people, both in terms of their mental health, but also how they feel about the landscape. So using volunteers to help with rehab can be a really powerful um, tool. This information, at least for us, we're not last year, unfortunately. So this information, this type of information, the preponderance of that literature is coming toward the end of that time. So what we're trying to do is build an adaptive desired future within the 2012 planning rule that allows us to, you know, to address that, be adaptive enough to address those changes. The other thing we're doing with our forest plan is we're managing it by not managing it by managing it by managing We're not using management areas. By and large, there's a couple of special emphasis areas, but we're trying to manage those mountain ranges as holistically as possible. So have that desired future listed for that future. Everybody's looking at me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but part of that question is management. How does management? Yeah. Like what, right. what, what, what could you do? I mean, one of the things that, that there were no constraints. What could you do that would make it easier to manage fires in the future? Or what we're doing right now? Well, along that line, let me just throw something out. We were starting the program in the Northern Rockies in the mid '80s. We had a budget for the whole region of $150,000 a year that could be used for wilderness fire. I don't know what that would equate to it now in dollars, but that wasn't a lot of money. And I would say now it's kind of unlimited. There's really not a big constraint on funding per se. Mm -hmm. Just to throw that out, mm -hmm. it gets one thought out there. I'll jump on that though, but don't we find most times that wilderness fires are cheaper than fires outside of wilderness anyway because of the way we're managing it. So budget-wise, it's 
Well, they're, they're, it's cheaper, but they're not cheaper than they would be if you put them out right away. Right. Yeah. And so that's a, uh, uh, they're cheaper per acre, but definitely not going to be any cheaper than putting them out at a tenth of an acre. Yep. Getting the resources to put out every single fire that starts. Specifically to, to Capital W Wilder, if you start to look at what we're, the decisions we're making, what we're doing, you know, if, I liken it somewhat to you know invasive species management, right? We have changed condition. Um, we have invasive species on the landscape, and we're we're in managing them, spraying, pulling, planting bugs. But that you know is that. That's a, a, a natural process. But we've had a human influence to bring these things in. We have a human influence in, in creating climate change. And yet, you know, in the case of invasive species, we still want to not allow that, that human influence process that we've kicked off to, to play its role. So, I mean, is that the same, the same role in, in climate change? Do we have a... a a desire to maintain the, the current existing, or is the desire to, you know, it's, it's the, the wild versus, uh, versus natural, so a little bit conundrum with climate change relative to fire management in wilderness, capital of wilderness. But I also think, you know, my experience in the last five years on large fire management, not in wilderness, we're already backing off a whole bunch because we don't have resources to, to or even less that we don't have resources is that we're not going to commit people and you know, funds to, to do things that are ineffective. So, I mean, there's, there's already some of that. You know, whether it's actually, I have a hard time with climate thing, but you know, you've talked to like 20 years ago, you know, a thousand acre fire, a couple thousand acre fire, it's going to be a really big thing. Well, uh, it's in very big thousand acres for us, we might not even look at it. So, I mean, it's just